So, so, so basically, I'm going to talk with you uh, this evening uh, about some examples of um, how you can fire smart uh, an existing home landscape, defensible space. And I'm also going to talk about how the role of native plants uh, in that defensible space should play out. Um, there's been a lot of concern about how to deal with gardens and landscapes in Marin uh, in increasingly long and intense uh, California fire season. And there has especially been confusion about how to, or even if to, use native plants. And we, we master gardeners in Marin believe that, that healthy gardens are an important component of a healthy and biodiverse ecology for the county um, and of a more fire resilient home uh, environment. And so we think that used appropriately, native plants might go a long way to helping build that healthy, biodiverse, resilient and fire smart environment that we'd like to see. Now, uh, I'm using a lot of examples uh, because the concern that we have is that people might get uptight and say, well, can I do that? Um, and the answer to that question is, yes, you can. And take a look at these examples um, uh, because uh, I did them. Uh, and so believe me, if I can do them, you can too. There we go. Um, here's some key issues that we're dealing with. First, reducing home wildfire hazard risk uh, while maintaining uh, home landscapes that build and support a healthy natural ecological environment in, in Marin County. And then learning how to continually adapt our home landscapes to keep up with the environmental challenges of climate change. Because this change that we're going through is not going to stop. Uh, it's going to keep going uh, until we figure out how to stop using greenhouse gases and stop the change in our climate. But first, a word from my sponsor. So we, we Marin Master Gardeners are trained, non-paid volunteers that are part of the UC Cooperative Extension. And our mission is to provide unbiased, peer-reviewed, research-based information to homeowners on horticulture, pest management, and sustainable uh, gardening practices. Our web uh, site is a great resource for lots of information on these topics, um, including fire smart landscaping. And our help desk uh, is now working again, and you can get answers to your questions pretty quick. So I'm going to focus mainly on specific examples of fire smart implementation and the use of native plants. And I'm, th th we're doing that to help reduce wildfire threat risk and maintain ecosystem health in that uh, fire smart in landscape. So um, I'm going to ask a question and uh, is this a good fire smart landscape design? Uh, well, I don't think so. And I don't know that anybody does think so. Uh, turning the landscape into a barren wasteland to fire smart a home, well, anything like this in any or all part of the landscape is not a healthy or fire safe solution to reducing fire hazard risk. In fact, it could exacerbate the situation. And our guiding premise is that it's also unnecessary. Homeowners can have a healthy, beautiful, biodiverse, sustainable fire smart landscape like this without denuding their gardens. And that's the main thesis of this presentation. How do we get to that? Home landscapes and gardens are important elements of a healthy environment and ecology in Marin County. They are worth preserving because 
they rebuild biodiversity by protecting and e extending Marin's unique plant communities, by encouraging beneficial wildlife, by creating habitat uh, for other native plants, for insects, birds, mammals, and other living creatures, frankly, including us people. Um, by preserving and protecting natural environments, by avoiding materials and practices that may harm them, by building and protecting the life in their soil, and by reducing the use of water, energy, and other critical resources. And finally, by mitigating climate change, by encouraging vital natural services that we can't do without, things like clean air, like vital, uh, like sequestering carbon, like building healthy soil, purifying groundwater and more. Creating or improving all of these uh, in home landscapes is one role of native plants in a healthy fire smart garden. The design of the landscape and its defensible spent, uh, space using fire smart guidelines reduces wildfire hazard risk. The use of native plants enhances natural environments. It makes them healthier, more sustainable, and more fire resilient. So a healthy and fire safe residential landscape is the result of providing best horticultural and gardening practices for your yard choosing plants that are in sync with your local environment, placing them in the garden with adequate vertical and horizontal space, giving them the right maintenance and care to keep them healthy and fire safe. And why is that? Because healthy plants are likely to be more fire resistant than plants that are struggling to survive. Let's start by thinking about why and how to use native plants. And using native plants is actually one important way to get more sustainable gardens. They make them better. They're more in tune with local plant environments. They support biodiversity. They're visited, used more heavily by wildlife. And they lighten the ecological load on the environment. They use less water, chemicals, and are more in tune with our environments. Producing healthier home and community landscapes that can only, that can also be more wildfire resilient. Why is that? Because native plants have grown up with everything else in Marin County. They've co-evolved with our Mediterranean climate, our geography, our topography, our soil, and all the animals, birds, insects that are here. They're an integral part of California's true landscape. Native plants have been deeply associated parts of long established local natural ecosystems for tens of thousands of years. Natives may just fit in and perform better than non-natives. They are better associated with an ecosystem's microclimate, soils, and mycorrhizal subterranean networks. This close association may also be the reason that native plants normally stay hydrated longer on just average amounts of rain or irrigation water. Another way that they can be not only healthier, but more resilient to wildfire. Moreover, as I said before, studies show that native wildlife visit and use native plants more frequently than non-native plants and stay longer when they do visit. But with some pollinator, butterfly and bird species, that can be as much as three to five times more frequently and or longer. Uh, that's why native plants is one important way to build habitat that may help decrease the serious decline in populations of these beneficial wildlife. My little Rufus hummingbird visitor knows this. He headed right for the hummingbird sage the morning he arrived. And finally, 
the deep root systems and canopies of native plants may also stabilize and preserve soils on slopes by reducing erosion. And that's important because as we all know, uh, Marin County is pretty hilly and erosion can often be a landscape and soil quality problem. But the native plant root systems may hold a hill better and more sustainably than anything else. This hill is about 30 feet from my home and was planted using native plants with vigorous root systems like Ceanothus, Manzanita, California Fremontia, California buckwheat, dwarf, dwarf coyote bush, and sage to reduce erosion on steep slopes like this. And this is a really steep slope. So far it works, but note how the plants or plant groupings are spaced for fuel separation. That's important too. This hill is not just functional though. It's also beautiful when in bloom from early spring through fall uh, and a great habitat for beneficial insects, pollinators, and birds. Uh, the um, the, uh, the salvia, all this salvia here is in bloom right now. Uh, it is incredible. And the number of native bees working that, I can't even count how many of them there are. So it really does work for more than just holding the hill. So let's look at some specific example of how homeowners might build defensible space to reduce wildfire, wildlife hazard risk without destroying their landscapes. And I'll also show some examples of using native plants to build or maintain sustainable earth-friendly gardens. But one overarching principle in establishing defensible space is in reducing landscape fire risk, how we do our gardens and landscapes is more important than the plants that we show, choose. Defensible space and the right plants in the right places given the right care. Uh, and here's why. What uh, Steve Swain, the UC Environmental Horticulture Advisor for Marin uh, says is that there are really no published fire wise or fire resistant plant lists that are science-based or peer reviewed. That he says that design and maintenance are more important than plant selection. Uh, and that's what we're gonna talk about. The real answer is that you should design, choose a landscape design and plants, native or non-native, frankly, whose requirements, their culture, their mature size, their maintenance and water requirements are in sync with your site. As I've said, that will produce both a healthy landscape and one that is more resilient to wildfire. Okay, so some fire smart landscape principles to reduce fire hazard risk, create defensible space around structures. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And in your landscape, plant placement and spacing is key. It should be less dense. Um, it should have vertical and horizontal. Um, and it should have their trees limbed up and shrubs pruned. And if you can, fire breaks throughout. Now let me explain. Um, we are concerned about all flammable objects near the home or in the defensible space. And that includes things like trash bins, wood piles, uh, tree and other garden debris, mulch, and, and yes, including your plants and your native plants, your neighbor's plants too. But second, you need to think about them as potential fuel in the landscape. And that's why we think about their placement and separation. Um, and then finally, 
You need to design the garden and choose the plants so that they can be adequately maintained and can have appropriate irrigation. Um, and, 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 and frankly, then you or someone else needs to get out and actually do that maintenance and keep that irrigation working. And then finally, um, you need to think about working with your neighbors. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through this. But the continued pruning, maintenance, and irrigation needed to keep a healthy garden healthy is also something that will produce a fire safe garden. So implementing defensible space, you start by working from the house out and you plan your design to reduce wildfire risk and reduce fuel loads. And again, we can't repeat this often enough, plant place, placement and fuel separation um, are the primary aims and consistent maintenance and appropriate irrigation are critical to maintaining those goals. So plan the work, but it doesn't have to all be done at once. It's important to understand that. People say, but I can't do all of that in the next two months. Well, the answer is you don't have to. Um, it doesn't have to be done. Prioritize your work and your projects. Get the ones done quickly that are the most important and the most critical and deal with the most critical problems. And then go on to the rest when you can address, address them appropriately. So start at the house and work out. So let's start at the most important area, Z zone zero or zero to five feet from the home. Uh, why is this important? This is where the ember storm that usually comes in a bad wildfire event uh, will land right next to your house. Um, and this is where uh, 60 to 80% of homes that are going to burn or are going to be severely damaged get that damage from. So this is the most important place to start. Uh, and here's what we need to do to protect against ember fall in this area immediately around the house. First of all, nothing flammable, no flammable mulch, fencing, furniture, trash bins, etc. You know, nothing at all. No dead branches or other debris, no roof litter, no tall plants under ease because the flames could rise two to three times their height. Nothing flammable attached to or close to the house. And that attached to includes maybe a wooden fence or a wooden gate to a fence. No branches within 10 feet uh, of the roof or from the chimney. And actually in most towns in uh, Marin County now, that is code, um, and, and so it's also important. So um, here's some the first things that we can look at. Um, if there are foundation plants or other combustibles uh, touching the house or close to it uh, or in front of windows or under eaves, or that are more than 18 to 24 inches tall, uh, or that are twiggy or easy to ignite by embers like these, then they should be removed and replaced. Well, first of all, removed, which we did, and replaced with materials that are safe to use within five feet of the house, including uh, non-combustible rock or gravel or pebbles or concrete or pavers or decomposed granite. 
Um, and if plants are used, they should not touch the house and they should be low growing and ignition resistant, appropriately hydrated, herbaceous, that is non-woody, perennials or animal, annuals or succulents. Um, and even here, consider native plants. So let's take a look at what's going on here. Uh, here, the beds were not wide enough to prevent new plants from touching the house and irrigation was difficult to bring in. So pebbles alone replaced the problematic plants in this particular area on the driveway. Uh, again, uh, you know, the pebbles are actually a pretty good color and um, this photograph may not do them, uh, you know, good justice, but they actually look pretty good. Um, the same situation existed here along the side of the house. Uh, here we had rose bushes and fluffy leaf plants right up against the house, clearly uh, more than two feet tall right under windows and eaves. Um, and they were removed, as you can see in the after picture, um, and the pebbles and the decomposed granite um, uh, path uh, have now put in a place, a good fire break of about eight to 10 feet from my home. Uh, and we're gonna keep it that way. Now to think about plants, to replace any that might need to be review, removed. So why think about native plants for this or frankly any other area in the defensive space? Well, here's a good list of plants in a fire smart or earth friendly landscape and that's native or non-native. They should be healthy and water wise and pollinator friendly and habitat builders and well-behaved, and by that we mean not invasive and don't produce a lot of debris. And finally, they should require low care and be easily maintainable. Well, that's a good list for plants in an earth fire smart or an earth friendly landscape. And as eight native plants check most of those boxes described, native plants might be among some of the homeowner's best choices. So the tall rosemary and lavender that existed in these areas in the back of the house were removed. Uh, and as shown in the picture uh, below, they were replaced with two to three uh, wide, foot wide beds of non-combustible pebbles close to the house and the borders beyond those planted in low growing coral bell hyb hybrids, sage hybrids, catmint, herbs, and strawberry plants. It looks beautiful in the spring. As a matter of fact, it looks beautiful today. That's how it looks today um, uh, and the early summer. And when the flowering is done, we cut it back to two to four inches as shown in the picture right here. Um, and that's a fire smart way to bring it through the fire season. Um, but, the, but the plants that we've used here, you know, a lot of homeowners are particularly concerned that, that leaving this zone zero area barren after removing problematic plants might ruin the beauty uh, and the value, frankly, of their homes. Uh, as you've seen from the previous slides on the zone zero plant placement, by choosing the right plants for the right places and given the right care, there may be useful and lovely um, uh, solutions to that concern. But remember, no plants should touch the house or be too close to it. There should be a non-combustible space between plants and the home. So in addition to the plants that you saw before, uh, there's uh, a number of other ways 
that you can deal with this. How about uh, four uh, native California wildflowers to start with? Uh, here we have a farewell to spring. Um, here we have cream cups. Uh, here we have California bells. And here we have a uh, five spot, uh, which you can see uh, this uh, California ringlet butterfly is uh, really uh, enjoying uh, right in front of us. Uh, and these might be only a few of the native wildflowers that might fill the bill for your area. Or how about some low growing herbaceous perennials? They might work in this area close to the house. Um, again, we have blue-eyed grass. Uh, here we have um, uh, a, a beech strawberry. Uh, here we have penstemon. Um, and here we have coast buckwheat. All of these are low growing species or cultivars and other low growing species or cultivars of these genera would also work well as would many other annual and perennial native herbaceous plants less than 12 to 18 inches tall. Or if you wanna get away from herbaceous plants, how about native succulents? Um, here we have Dudlia. Uh, this is Catalina Island Dudlia. Uh, this is Coast Dudlia. And here we have Louisia, or as they're called, cliff maids. Um, uh, these are beautiful flowering, very small plants that grow um, uh, very well in the home garden. Oops. So we've now looked at the, the most important if you get nothing done this season, start working on this. Um, but then if you've got some more time and you plant and your plan is working, let's consider the area beyond zone zero, zones one and two, beyond five feet of the house. At, at here, flames and uh, heat are likely, uh, less likely to ignite a, a home. So we'll be looking at examples of close to the house, lower and appropriately irrigated plants, uh, moving away, some larger shrubs, shrubs and trees, um, 30 uh, feet for the house, we can use um, wood mulch um, and vertical and horizontal space between the shrubs and trees, especially on slopes is very important. Hardscape fuel grape breaks between plantings where possible. Of course, again, all plants accessible for cleanup, maintenance, and irrigation. And because now we're farther away from the house, we really want to think about working with neighbors to achieve appropriate defensible space. Um, so uh, one of the first things that you think about, particularly if you've got a somewhat larger place that I, that as I do, is mowing. The first thing to do is to mow annual grass and weeds in any open space on your property. As you can see in this picture, uh, the grass and weeds in this area of my property, uh, this was taken, would you believe, um, in uh, early March, uh, and uh, they are uh, at two to four feet tall. Um, we mowed then, and we're ready to mow again. Uh, we do that every year. We usually mow in April and May to mid-June uh, without fail. And when we do it, it looks like this. And I talked about neighbors. Well, beyond this fence, uh, which is 96 feet from the house, um, is Marin County's Rush Creek Open Space Preserve. They mow, and they have just done it, an additional uh, 20 to 30 yards on that boundary beyond our, our boundary. And on, on the other side of the house, they do about 40 yards. 
um, uh, there early this year because everybody is concerned about this. We work with this neighbor. They're a good one. So here we have uh, an interesting uh, problem. This photo, which is the B4 photo, shows a large acacia hedge. That's about 35, 40 feet long. In this area, it's probably about uh, seven to eight feet tall. And it's uh, beyond it, in this area here, is a dense um, uh, area of invasive cotoneaster under low growing uh, coastal live oaks on a steep hill moving up to our home uh, and potentially a significant serious fire ladder that needed work. So here we have the second thing because these things were overgrown, woody and unmaintainable. And so below, we removed the fire ladders. Um, we limbed up the live oaks. We took out the um, Katoni Aster in this area and the entire um, acacia hedge. Um, and this now is clear. It protects the house. Um, and uh, it allows for clear entry of firefighting equipment if, it, if, if needed, which we hope never will happen. Uh, but it looks a little barren. Well, surprise. Uh, in the spring, that, that was all that work was done uh, in the fall of 2018. In the spring of 2019, some small arroyo lupin and uh, California poppy plants volunteered in this cleared space. Uh, those seeds must have been down there for 10 to 12 years, just waiting to get to the light. Um, the, when they went to seed, we added some more seed. And in the following spring in 2020, there were 40 feet of a royal lupin, cow poppies, and some clarkia. Um, they started blooming in early to mid-February. They continued until mid to late April. And then since their annuals, they were cut down for seed for the fo following year. Uh, it's truly fire smart and good use of native plants. And they bloomed again this year. Uh, in fact, they're still in bloom. Um, so, you know, we're twice blessed with that. Um, now, sometimes always on this slide. So, but even after removing the, the acacia and the cotoneaster, if we continued on, my neighbor's large myoporum hedge uh, was still overgrown into my yard. Um, actually, uh, you know, this was less than uh, 12 feet here where they were hanging over. Um, and infested with myoporum thrips. So there was significant dead or dying wood, as you can see from this picture. I had it trimmed uh, on the property line from my side of the fence. And this is what it now looks like, clear to more than 10 feet from the side of the house. Um, it's still not a great solution. Uh, it still could threaten um, are my house and my neighbor's house, uh, but it's much better than it was. Uh, and that's important. And we intend to keep it that way. Um, now, this next area is in zone one and two. We've got uh, 10 deciduous valley oak trees that are marvelous uh, and set off our house. Um, but they're uh, as you can see from this picture, their branches were hanging down close to the ground. In fact, here, they were actually touching the ground. Uh, and, and again, that's a, a potential fire ladder. So here, it looks like 
the trees and plants were removed. But all that was done really was to lend these trees up to about 10 to 15 feet. Um, uh, it, it allows us to get at the plants that are uh, around and even under the trees uh, to take care of them and maintain them well. Um, and even it allows the lights that are under the trees to be even more striking at night than they were before. Uh, under oak trees further out in zone two, we had prostrate leptospermum planted to provide erosion control on a very steep portion of the garden. Uh, and it also provided white flowers in the spring and early summer in the tree shade. It was a bad choice, wrong plant, wrong place. Um, these had become overgrown and twiggy. Uh, they were in an area that was difficult to maintain them, uh, and especially to prune out dead wood. And their needle-like foliage um, all added up to a serious potential fire hazard. So they're gone now. And we put wattles in the, on the hill to hold the hill until the plants that we've planted, um, uh, which are Anchor Bay, Ceanothus, and low-growing Catalina perfume, um, can take over. And they are taking over. Uh, I've got to update this picture, but it looks more like this than this now. The Budlia, here is Budlia, um, and the uh, Salvia bandagi on the right here are both useful pollinator plants, but they're under valley oaks and they could have become a fire ladder hazard because they had both become seriously overgrown and twiggy. Uh, they have now been reduced in height and width, both of them, uh, and they've been cleaned out of dead wood throughout them. Um, so they are now fire safe and we hope to keep them that way. If that becomes a problem, we will replace them with something easier to take care of. Uh, and that is an equivalently good um, um, uh, pollinator plant. So we've been working really hard uh, over the past three years uh, to continue to work and maintain on other areas of the hill to create spaces, reducing the fuel sep or increasing fuel separation and reducing fuel loads on these plants um, to reduce or slow potential fire spread. Um, and we think that it, we're getting there pretty well. Uh, my colleague, uh, Jim Casper, uh, is even better. Uh, he's got good plant separation and he uses non-combustible stone um, and rock in the areas between the plants and on paths and patio areas to provide fire breaks that will minimize or eliminate wildfire runs and ember flare-ups in the garden. Um, so uh, that's what we mean by hardscape in the garden. When I say that, we mean something like this. But we also mean something like this. We've got reasonably good hardscape separation between the garden and my home. And we've got fire breaks on the hill because we've got hardscape covered stairs, uh, paths, and walls and patio. But a use of hardscape in the garden itself could be a whole lot better. And we're trying to think about how we can do that on these steep areas uh, of the hill. Uh, remember, we're trying to achieve horizontal and vertical space to increase fuel separation and reduce fuel mass. What, what this and other the, of the foregoing examples show is that wildfire hardening of the landscape can be done without leaving large barren spaces or denuding the garden. 
Often, you can achieve the desired results by pruning plant bulk and height, or removing branches, or replacing plant removals with beautiful natives. And so here's an example of what we think is good fire smart design. The trees and shrubs spaced on the slope here help prevent erosion. The non-combustible retaining wall that goes across this entire area um, between the planting island and the rest of the, and, and be, between the plants and the home is a good fire break. Um, and the patio creates fire breaks between the planting island here and the rest of the landscape and the home. Uh, we've got mostly native or Mediterranean climate plants in here. And, and so therefore, in a relatively small space, this is really only about 17 by 12 feet in size, um, we have a drought tolerant, pollinator friendly, earth friendly habitat corridor garden that could probably fit in just about any uh, property in Marin County. Um, using native plants like these, and these are lower growing native plants because we're near the house. Uh, this is uh, lilac. Verbena. It's a native verbena. Um, it is an amazingly good um, uh, pollinator plant, um, and uh, it really it really works very very well for us. Here again is the hurricane sage with uh, our visiting um, uh, Rufus hummingbird. This is red California buckwheat, um, which is a good summer growing plant for us. Uh, it's a real good pollinator, as was the bees bliss, which is a spring plant, which has stopped blooming, but has been taken over by its neighbor, the Pozo Blue on the hill, that is so loaded with um, uh, native uh, bumblebees. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, so there are solutions. Lilac verbena. Hummingbird sage, red California buckwheat. This is Bees Bliss sage. It's a ground cover. And this is the Pozo Blue. That is one of the sages on the hill that's in, uh, bloom, in bloom right now and attracting an incredible number of bees. OK, here's some more relatively low growing plants for use closer to the home. This is uh, emerald uh, carpet manzanita. This is um, Everett's Choice California fuchsia. Uh, this is Baja pitcher sage. You can see the flowers here. All of these are excellent pollinator plants. Um, here's another um, sage ground cover. Uh, which blooms in uh, spring and early summer. It's actually just stopped blooming. That's point sal spreader sage. And here are the native uh, California chaparral clematis, um, which uh, blooms in the spring uh, and uh, is just a beautiful plant. Um, further away from the home, we got some larger shrubs or trees on the border between zones one and two that are pollinator and bird friendly. Um, this is uh, Western Redbud in bloom. Um, uh, it's amazing when it is in bloom, it's just beautiful. Uh, this is a large um, uh, manzanita. Uh, it's a Monica is its name. Uh, it will eventually grow probably about 12 to 15 uh, feet tall, and there are other large manzanitas which are striking uh, in, in the landscape. And here's Ray Hartman, which is a large uh, ceanothus. It's in bloom. 
Uh, you can see how beautiful it is when it is in bloom in the spring. Um, it also makes an excellent screen plant. Um, it'll grow about 10 to 12 feet tall. Uh, and here's some shrubs that can potentially get really big, uh, but are also pollinator and bird friendly, like the uh, a small plant of Spring Showers California Current, which has only been in the ground for uh, three years and is already about six to seven feet tall. Uh, this is um, sugar bush, which is a um, uh, excellent plant for hummingbirds. Um, and here is a summer holly. Uh, this is really big. This particular picture uh, is uh, uh, it's about 25 feet tall. Uh, I'm not sure I've even got room for it on my, on my property, but if you've got some big property, it's really amazing, and it really brings in the birds. And here's Pacific Wax Myrtle, uh, which is a really excellent uh, screen plant uh, to use, and they're all natives. Uh, some more larger ground covers include the uh, Carmel Ceanothus, which includes Yankee Point and other cultivars. Um, here's uh, Santa Rosa Sage, uh, and here's the Catalina Perfume that I talked about earlier. Uh, this right now is about seven to eight feet across and about three to four feet tall, it eventually will get 12 to 20 feet across. And it's an excellent uh, evergreen um, ground cover. And then finally, um, we've got some things that are really farther from the home. Uh, this is a, a copse of uh, Manzanita Lewis Edmonds. Um, they're really beautiful. Uh, they get about eight feet tall. Here we've got some Toyon. Uh, I wish that one of these days I will actually be able to get some Christmas berries as a uh, Christmas decoration, uh, but apparently the robins and the cedar waxwings have other uh, plans for them uh, since I've never had a chance to do that. Here we have California Fremontia, um, uh, Ken Taylor, it's the low growing variety. Uh, it's about, this is probably now about 15 feet wide and about, uh, I'd say six feet tall at, the, at its highest. It is in bloom now. It is in bloom. It looks like this right now. Um, and here are some early blooming large Ceanothus. Uh, they're called blue jeans, and the reason why is they look like a thousand washed pair of blue jeans. So up to now, we've been talking about fire smarting, the defensible landscape around the home to reduce wildfire risk. But what about the home? Well, as master gardeners, we're not really trained to give homeowners advice on home hardening uh, unless you happen to meet a master gardener who's a builder or a firefighter. I'm not either of those. Um, so uh, the first place that I will send you to find out about home hardening is that QRL, Fire Safe Marin, Harden Your Home. They've got amazingly good information. But to give you some idea as to what might be done, Let's consider the following work we've recently completed on my home. I may not be an expert on home hardening, but I am an expert on this. My home has a class A roof. It's concrete, uh, shingles, metal gutter, gutters and downspouts, twin pane, but not thermal pane, uh, windows, and an internal sprinkler system. But our wooden shingles and trim, everything that you see in this picture is wood. Uh, and foundation, soffit, and gable vents were not fire resistant. 
Well, the gable vents, we started work on when we did the work on zone zero around our house. Uh, and these are Vulcan vents. They are fire resistant and they're, uh, they are now installed around the entire foundation of the house. Um, but wildfire may not be the only threat to your home. These neighbors, um, acorn woodpeckers, can do some serious damage, including making your home more vulnerable to ember storm incursion. Now, how can cute birds like that, you ask, do that? Well, here's how. Our feathered friends drilled hundreds of homes in two areas, uh, two sides of our house, and they filled them with acorns. Um, but these holes, well, that was their new granary. Um, but these holes could also admit embers into the interior space between the interior walls and the wood siding, possibly taking the house. Um, the uh, fire inspectors from uh, Novato Fire said that we really should do something about that. So we wanted to make our home both fire and acorn woodpecker resistant. First, you bring the home up to code. Here, by installing the plywood sheathing that was not uh, on the home when we took the shingles off. And then you install the hardy board fiber cement fire resistant siding, trim, and soffit enclosures, and more Vulcan fire resistant soffit and gable vents. Now, this is the way it looks today. It actually looks pretty nice. Um, and we're told we don't have to paint it for at least 14 years, which that's really great. And thank the good Lord that we haven't had a fire. So I can't report on that. And I hope I never will be able to. But after almost six months, I can report that there's not been one bloody acorn woodpecker hole drill in the siding. So to recap, um, let's start by thinking about what do you look for in native plants? Well, a native plant fire smart landscape will nurture your soil, encourage biodiversity, and help mitigate climate change and encourage wildlife and help reduce wildfire risk. Native plants prevent erosion. And when they're well spaced on slopes, they are fire smart. So in terms of creating space, reducing wildfire risk, native plants can be a helpful solution um, if you keep them well maintained. So what do you look for? Well, and this is in a handout that um, should be available through uh, uh, Marin Water um, uh, that is just copies of these slides so you don't have to take notes. But zero to five from the house, you know, low growing, ignition resistant, herbaceous annuals and perennials uh, or succulents. Nothing, no plants, nothing touching the house. And California natives. In zone one, 50 to 30 feet from the house, smaller shrubs and trees, good vertical and horizontal separation between them, non-combustible fire breaks between the plant clusters, or at least good spacing between the plant clusters. And then in zone two, larger shrubs and trees and wood mulch. So here's some helpful 
um, stuff that's in the handout. Um, our help desk is working again. Um, so if you call us or send us emails, uh, you'll actually get an answer really quick. Um, Calscape, which is a California native plant society tool, is an excellent way to choose plants in your area, native plants in your area. And these three books are the Bibles of gardening with native plants. And they are available in all, almost all, in fact, I think all libraries in Marin County. So these are resources um, for specific home sites and specific applications in your home. And as Greg pointed out, come see us at Ember Stomp. I'll be there from, I think, 10 to 1. Uh, so you could ask me any questions you don't get to ask me tonight. Uh, but the Master Gardeners will have a demonstration garden of all of the things that I have talked about. Um, plus, you'll also be able to get uh, food and entertainment and bring the kids um, because uh, there's going to be a bunch of stuff for them to do. Questions? Hi, Bob. This is Greg here to deliver just a few questions that we have. If anybody has additional questions, feel free to put those into the Q&A. Um, the first one we that I actually answered, and I think you've just reinforced, um, was when you were going through plants and asked if we would provide a list of those. Um, so I recapped a few, um, but I think the the Marin Master Gardener website has some great resources on California native plants uh, and then Calscape is a more extensive resource. Um, so I, I think that's covered unless you have anything else to add, Bob? Uh, no, that, uh, those, those resources are, uh, I think, excellent resources um, to use and they're frankly easy to use. Um, and, and that, you know, that, that, that's something really nice. Uh, you don't have to be uh, a botanist uh, to use either of those resources. Uh, and I will send around Bob's handout tomorrow uh, with all those resources on. Uh, and I can vouch for at least one of those books that Bob mentioned, the, the Carol Bornstein one is, is a book I've had for a long time and it's accessible uh, and it also goes fairly deep if you want to, or you can just kind of flip through and see rough descriptions and pictures, uh, highly, highly recommended. Um, a good question here from uh, Myron, uh, which relating to Manzanita uh, uh, being, it asked if, if Manzanita is highly flammable. And I think you showed a, a couple of suggestions relating to Manzanita. One was the very low growing emerald carpet. Um, and then later on, as you were talking about plants further away from the home, you had more shrubby examples of manzanitas. Um, I don't know if you could talk about that a little bit, Bob. Okay, sure. Uh, you know, um, manzanita is, uh, is called a fire-enabled plant. Um, and, uh, and that's what gives people a real worry about it. But what fire enabled means is that if there is a fire, it will burn um, and then it will come back from the burn by putting new shoots out from the crown of the plant. And in fact, they call it fire enabled because that's the way the chaparral renews itself. Um, um, and so, if you're going to use the larger manzanitas, then what you want to do is place them appropriately. You want to um, make sure that they are pruned appropriately. Um, and you want to make sure that they are farther away from the home. Um, and, and then uh, I've got a lot of manzanita 
uh, I would say 50, 60 plants, but none of them is any closer to the home than about 20 feet. Um, and so uh, when, when the uh, wildfire uh, mitigation specialist from um, Novato Fire came uh, to examine my area, um, uh, which, which you should have an inspection if you can get one. Uh, I pointed these out to him and he said that the way they were situated um, and the fact that there were um, paths uh, and stairs uh, around them that uh, you know were fire breaks made them and also the fact that they were farther away from the house made them safe to use. Uh, Perfect. I think that, that that covered it for me, Bob. And I, I, I manzanita is one of my favorite plants, and uh, I feel like it's gotten a bad rap. Um, and and indeed, it you know, as you as you said earlier as well, it's really you know positioning and maintenance um, at the end of the day most plants and many things in our landscapes and homes are flammable and so kind of right. consciously determining where we where we position things is essential and how we maintain them over time yep okay we've got another good question here from carolyn um she has wood chips and gorilla hair mulch um, she asks if she can put rock on top or should she remove it first? I think there's two layers to this question I'm hoping you could touch on. Um, one is uh, just talking a little bit about mulch products, organic mulch products in general, uh, especially the gorilla hair. And then secondly, the, whether she could put the rock on top or whether it's best to remove it first. Yeah, I, I, the, the gorilla hair is something that we master gardeners really do not recommend. Uh, and the reason why is particularly in an ember storm, um, the embers fall into that, they will smolder and then they can, you know, ignite. Uh, and, and the gorilla hair burns uh, very, very well. Um, there, there, were, there were tests done on a number of types of uh, both organic and inorganic uh, mulches done by the uh, Cooperative Extension of the University of Nevada. Uh, and what they found was that uh, a gorilla hair was uh, probably at the top of the flammability list. Uh, of all of the things that they tested. Um, and so I would remove it if that's possible. Um, and uh, the other problem with gorilla hair is it tends to mat down. And when it does mat down and it dries out like it's doing right now, um, it becomes very hard to rehydrate. Um, and, you know, it almost is like a, the, the water kinds of beads up and runs off it in, in some cases. So it's not a, actually terribly good mulch from, from that point of view. Um, uh, so I, you know, I, it, it's hard for me to say, you know, well, remove it. I know that that's a lot of work and it, it's, it's a lot of money to replace it. But um, if it's close to the house, I would certainly do that. If it's farther away from the house, say 30 or more feet, well, that maybe can go down to the bottom of the list of things to do, but particularly if it's upslope from you, um, but it's not good stuff. Now, there are other, there are other kinds of um, um, uh, mulches that are much safer to use. Um, uh, there, are, there are things called arbor mulch, um, which is a, um, a, a wood mulch that has been exposed to a composting um, a technique, which reduces its flammability. Um, uh, the problem is 
there, there are only about, uh, as far as I know, two places um, in this area where you can get it. So it's not you know, readily available. Um, uh, there are um, a number of other kinds of wood-based mulches um, that um, you, you know are are um, are okay, are not so not so flammable that th that you would do it, but you would never ever ever put those in zero to five. Never. Um, the only things that should go in zero to five as a mulch are inorganic mulches like pebbles or uh, gravel or things like that. Um, uh, most, of the, uh, most of the mulches that are available, um, if, they are, if they are chunky or, or um, uh, you know, uh, granular, uh, they, are, they are probably less concerned uh, than um, other kinds of mulches. What I would recommend is, frankly, that you come to uh, Ember Stump because we will have um, a, a variety of mulches uh, available for you to look at. And we will have uh, experts from the fire agencies to talk to about them. And they're the people who really know uh, what what is safe and what is not. That's great. Thank you, Bob. Um, and if you didn't see, I added a link to a study from FireSafe Marin. Oh, good. Um, which basically reinforces what Bob just said. Um, they they determined that composted wood chips are kind of the least combustible of the organic mulches. Uh, and I put in the chat one example uh, from West Marine Compost that I'm aware, aware of. Is, is there a, another one you're aware of, Bob? Um, you know... It's okay uh, to give them a plug, if so. There, there is, uh, I believe, uh, there is a place in, in the Mill Valley area um, that has something similar to that. I can't remember the name. That's okay. Um, anyway, um, they, they, do, they do exist. Um, so, um, okay, great. Well, uh, we've got a couple more questions that came up. So let's move on from David. Um, they have an old invasive campsis trumpet vine. If you know that, Bob, the kind of put, uh, orange sort of trumpet vine. Right. Um, it's on, it's not near the house. It's on the property line. Uh, any suggestions? And then he also asks about uh, citrus uh, trees, lemon, orange, pomelo. The, the, I, I, you know, I'm, I don't have a lot of experience with the trumpet vine. Um, uh, where it is, um, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, your property is probably about the safest place for it. Um, there are uh, vines where it, it depends on where you live. Um, and I would, I would go to Calscape, uh, which is www.calscape.org um, and put in your um, zip code and go to the vines that they recommend in for your area. Um, that might replace the, that particular uh, plant. Um, it's you know it's hard for me without knowing where you live and and what's growing around it and so on to make a suggestion. But that would be a good way to see different things uh, that might you might be interested in replacing it with. Um, it sounds like you're interested in replacing it, and that's a good way to do it. Um, in terms of citrus trees, um, uh, I grow mine in, um, uh, in uh, you know, uh, uh, wine barrels. 
because the uh, clay on my hill is so crappy that I don't think any uh, citrus tree worth its salt would want to grow in it. Um, so, but I, I, I think they're great. I get, I get great <coughs> lemon, <coughs> excuse me, limes and Mexican limes from them. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and they do very well for me, uh, but not in uh, Novato clay soil. In terms of their flammability, they are no more flammable than anything else. And since they require even water during the summer, they are well hydrated and therefore my guess would be not a very dangerous situation. If they, however, they are, you know, growing right up against your home, that's a no-no. We, we don't want you to have stuff that's growing right on, on, you know, against your siding or anything like that. Um, and so you might have to deal with that either by pruning it back, um, uh, you know, that, the code is uh, 10 feet away uh, for anything. Uh, so, so that might be a problem. But uh, otherwise, they're fine, I think. Great. Thank you, Bob. Um, and from Shauna, um, situation uh, of that back fence uh, within 15 feet of their house that is lined with Italian cypress. Uh, oh. They've had the recommendation to remove those, and Sean is looking for replacement ideas to give a similar green wall feel. Uh, it also provides a nice sound barrier. That's a yeah. tricky one. Uh, the, the, um, he, uh, she said it was only 15 feet from, from the back of the house? Yeah. OK. Well. Uh, um, uh, there are, um, you know, wax myrtle uh, is, a, is, a, is a pretty good uh, barrier plant. Um, uh, and and uh, it depends on, on where you live, um, you know, for it. Um, uh, the, uh, again, um, there are some hedges, but what, but what, what we don't recommend is a continuous hedge. And so, uh, and the reason for that is that's a fire runway. Um, and uh, it, it, it can be a dangerous situation in the, wildfire, in the wildfire. So what we recommend is that you kind of stagger these, um, you know, and leave space between them, whatever plant you use, um, uh, you, you know, you, Instead of one solid wall touching, you know, uh, you, if you stagger them, it becomes an optical solid because you can't see around them. Um, but it it has the spacing that will, you know, give you some fuel separation, uh, and that may be the way to deal with it. The the, the specific things to um, uh, pick, go to our website. Um, you, will, you will find uh, recommendations for hedging plants, uh, hedging plants. Go to the, the, uh, the uh, Bornstein Frost um, uh, and uh, uh, book on California plants for the garden. If you go to the back appendixes, they have lists of plants to be used for hedging or privacy. Um, uh, so that's something that you can go to the library and get, or you can go to Calscape. Uh, again, put in your zip code um, and uh, uh, download um, what they are recommending for hedges. Um, uh, and. Uh, I'm, and I'm sure you'll find something um, that that you would like. Cianothus um, is a good 
hedge plant. Um, and you have the, uh, you have the, uh, uh, you know, bounty of blue flowers in the, in the, in the spring. Um, it's a little close to the house because, you know, Ceanothus hedgers are, get big. Um, but, but do, do, do a little bit of research on Calscape on our website in, in uh, Carol Bornstein and David Frost's and Bart O'Brien's book. Um, and I think you'll be able to come up with something that will be satisfactory for you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bob. And uh, thank you everybody for attending this evening's webinar. We had a really great attendance this evening. It shows that this is an important topic uh, on our minds, as it should be. Um, and once again, hopefully some of you can make it out to Ember Stomp this weekend. That's, and you can go to the FireSafe Marin website for more information on that. Um, so again, thank you so much, Bob, and thank you everyone for joining and for the wonderful questions. We hope it was useful and we will be in touch via email with you all in the near future. Great, thanks for coming. Yeah, okay, good night, everybody.